how would you like to know what most billionaires have in common and how they operate and why they're so successful? Hi, I'm Jared Krause. I'm the host of the Buying Online Business, the podcast. And today, I'm speaking with Dennis Yu, who has over 20 years of digital marketing experience, ranging, ranging from mastering Facebook and LinkedIn ads to scaling people's personal brands and businesses. I'm talking getting Facebook ads up to a million dollars a day in ad spend. He's a speaker, a mentor. He's worked with a lot of massive brands, social like Social Media Examiner, Forbes, and a multitude of huge household names that a lot of you guys probably know about. In this podcast episode, Dennis and I speak about AI and content generation and why we need humans. And he says a really good quote around tools, tools using tools and AI. And I think it's fascinating for you to hear, especially from one of the you know, leading um, industry minds in social media and digital marketing. We also talk about the dollar a day strategy that he's used to help scale brands to get them to a million dollars a day in ad spend alone. We talk about the power of mentors, how much of a role mentors have played a role in his actual life, in my life. We also share the difference between a mentor and a coach. And I think it's really fascinating. I, I break it down into long-term versus short-term um, you know, guidance. Uh, we also talk about a billionaire mindset. And he's got a lot of friends that are billionaires, hangs around a lot of very wealthy people, very smart people that have done ama- absolutely amazing things. He does a lot of name dropping uh, just because, not to, not to boost himself up, but to talk like this is how this person operates and this is what he learned from this person and why and, and how that's invaluable for us. We also talk about the power of sharing knowledge and how valuable that can be for you on your journey as well. Now, well, this is such a valuable episode. Dennis is a brilliant mind. I'm sure you're absolutely going to love it. Let's dive in. What's up? This is Jared and I am stoked to have you here. Before we dive into the show, I want to remind you that for a limited time, you can get one-to-one voice note mentoring with me to help you buy and grow your online business. I'm opening up just a few slots of voice note coaching to give you one-to-one access to me via Coachbox. You'll tell me your goals and challenges and we'll work through them together. I'll ask questions, I'll tell you what I think, and we'll get you ticking boxes and achieving your online income goals. You can message me anytime and I'll respond within 48 hours. Right now you can get 20% off by using the coupon code Jared, that's J-A-R-Y-D, and I'll drop the link in the show notes so you can find out more. Until then, let's get on with the episode. Dennis, welcome to the pod. Jared, good to see you. Good to see you too. Now, I just want to dive straight on into it. I want to talk about a bunch of, I want to get to the digital marketing aspect and the paid ads, which is what you're very well known for. But I've also seen you speak about SEO and content creation, Mm -hmm. right? And the theme Mm -hmm. of the day, the flavor of the year, I guess, of 2023 is really about AI content creating AI content and then mixing it, you know, making SEO worthy as well. Now, yeah. I'm a big believer that SEO is going to evolve as it always has. Maybe mm-hmm. not as fast as what most people believe. But have you have you been talking about content, how to create content strategy that is good for SEO with AI? And and what's your what's your take on that? A lot of people, as you've seen with other tools with SEO, are using tools as a shortcut. They're being lazy to spin content and auto-generate content. And my job at the search engines 25 years ago was to bust people who were trying to do that. So (laughs) I understand there's the view of people that are trying to do, you know, businesses that want SEO benefit, people that claim to be SEO experts that do SEO. My view is from the standpoint of the search engine. So I have a different view than these other people because... I was at the search engines like that. We're always trying to protect search results. So my view with chat GPT and whatnot is that it's just another set of tools. And if you abuse it, then it'll hurt you because they can spot when you're using chat GPT, they can spot when it's been recycled and regurgitated and whatnot. So you saw Google came out with EEAT. Yeah. And it used to be the expertise, authority, and trust. They added, they added an e extra E. Yeah. And why did they do that? Because they knew people were going to use ChatGPT to write articles about all kinds of stuff. So 
how do you make your stuff bulletproof so you don't get in trouble? You start with the seed of your own experience, mm. your own stories about what happened. And I think the best way to do that is little video stories about what happened. Podcasts like this, where, I mean, maybe in a year or two from now, you can have these fake podcasts where you can't tell if it's actually you know Jared or Dennis. But what I tell business owners and founders to do is start with little stories of your best customers, of reviews, of behind the scenes, of you know like FaceTime ish kinds of videos. Mm. Then use ChatGPT to enhance it. So if you've got, let's say you're a law firm in LA and you've got cases in different areas of LA and you've got location service pages. So you want, you want to rank on. Beverly Hills, personal injury attorney, Culver City, dog bite, Long Beach, you know, slip and fall, what if combinations of city plus service. Mm. Well, then you've got customers in Long Beach and Torrance and Culver City and Redondo Beach and these other places. So why not leverage your database of what you have and then use Chat GPT to enhance that? Use the AI tools, for example, to like we could take this podcast and the AI there's a bunch of tools now. Every day there's like 10 new tools. The AI can chop up this video and edit it into different clips and find the cut points, find the hooks, add the lower thirds, just like you know, a fireflies that AI can do the meeting transcription and the summary. That's what you use AI for to create efficiency, not to replace the human. Yeah, spot on agree. So this podcast is going to be edited by human beings, uh, but I have got got a tool that I have just uh, decided to use and I asked my assistant if she would if it would reduce her time and make her job easier and she said it would yeah. and it's going to cost Descript is the one I recommend sorry use Descript Descript yeah there's podcast. Descript and there's another one by HubSpot that we're looking at uh, you can buy a certain amount of credits and it basically helps with episode highlight highlights guest um, yeah. authors and bios and brings transcriptions and everything together. <clears throat> and, yeah. but the fact is, it's only gonna be used as a tool to make her job easier and better and make the content better. It's not an, the answer and replacing her right. job. She's using it as a tool. Whereas most people are freaking out about AI is going to take mm -hmm. over and nobody's gonna have any jobs. Well, the reality mm -hmm. is, if you're gonna use a search engine, and all the content is regurgitated and it's all linear and it's boring to read, yeah. are you going to read it? No. And then no. there's no more Google because Google makes its money from users who see ads and click on ads, right? So yeah. <clears throat> I'm glad that you mentioned that because there's so much fear mongering around AI. I think it's an excellent tool, but it's just not the shortcut or the answer. Well, a tool using a tool is still a tool. <laughs> yeah. And I just had... I had dinner with the VP tonight in charge of AI at Google. Okay. And I was over at her house and we talked about what this means. And of course, you know, she wants people to use Bard and, mm -hmm. you know, she's got different things to say about open AI, which, you know, created chat GPT. But the basic idea is that, and I agree with her, is that a large language model, which basically writes words one at a time based on probabilities is not the same thing as search mm -hmm. because of hallucinations because you don't really know it's accurate, because search engines are built upon the idea of the canonical. No, I'm biased too, because I come from the search engine background, mm. right? Which we do have a lot of machine learning. We do have a lot of AI involved here, but using AI to produce content or to or thinking that it's going to replace search engines, I think is naive. Yeah, I totally agree. <clears throat> now, you're, you've moved from search to paid, from what I see. Well, and you know a lot about both, obviously. Uh, but are you seeing there's tools that can help with social media ads? I know that I know that like you know this podcast can be split up into Instagram Reels and chopped up and be used yep. for that. Uh, where else are you seeing that um, being implemented that you feel is actually a good use of a tool? So the AI is an amplifier of what's already working well. Mm. So. I got my start in Facebook ads, was it 16 years ago? I started in 2007, May, when it first came out. And remember, I'm a search engine. I started as a search engine engineer. But I found that if you had something that worked for a particular audience who had a particular need, maybe they searched a particular keyword, they watched a particular YouTube video, 
you can match that audience on Facebook and you could use that same content. And when that same content and that same audience intersects, you get a sale. So I thought, well, this is great. If something's working in YouTube, I can get it to work on Facebook. If it works on Facebook, I can get it to work on TikTok. If it works on TikTok, I can get it to work inside Snapchat. So I don't really see a distinguishing between search and social, except that social might be more driven by who the user is and search is more on direct intent. But even those lines are being blurred. So the idea of someone being a social media expert versus a search expert is like saying, you know, does someone use their left hand or their right hand? Well, you need both of your hands for different things, right? Yeah. So I, I guess I've been doing it, you know, this for 30 years. So this makes me look kind of old, but I think it's a false dichotomy to categorize search versus social or TikTok versus Facebook, because if your goal is to sell, you have, you run an online business and you got, you want to get more people to buy. Why wouldn't you set all the remarketing pixels at the same time in your tag manager? Why wouldn't you take content that works in one channel and make it work for all the other channels? Why wouldn't you create content actually independent of all the other channels? So if you're going to make the content, it can be repurposed to YouTube, to your blog, to the Google My Business, to you know TikTok, Twitter, whatever, Quora, mm. any of these other places. It just needs to be formatted slightly differently. But if you have something compelling to say, you have knowledge about something, why would you only put it on YouTube? Well, you'd be crazy not to because then you're single source dependent on just that one, uh, one medium, right? Yeah. And then you're not dependent upon just paid or organic. Yeah. The way I view paid is as an extension of organic, something that's already working well, a content targeting combination, a certain audience you're solving a certain problem for. Mm. If it's working organically, why wouldn't you put ad dollars behind it? And if something sucks and it's not compelling content, putting ad dollars on it is like flooring the car when the e-brake is on. It doesn't make any sense. You can't force your way there. Yeah. So I our whole dollar a day strategy is find something that's working. And let's try to replicate that same content across other audiences. Let's set all the remarketing pixels. So if you don't have any remarketing, then set the Google, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn remarketing pixels. And that gives you an extra 20% in sales. Yeah. Create lookalike audiences. Your best content, maybe it's a video, turn it into an article. You're, just, you're, you're taking the thing that works and just reformatting it to work in other channels and then running ads against it on top of that. Do you find, and this happened to me, do you find there are people that, and I guess mainly with e-commerce, this is a thing where people really go heavily down the paid ad route and don't focus yeah. on organic, end up at some point struggling when their ads don't work as well? Well, the paid side <clears throat> ends up being an LTV versus CAC issue. Yeah. So because the cost of ads are always going to keep going up, and it's always been the case for the last 20-something years, you have to do things to increase the LTV, which allows you to compete and be able to pay more for acquisition. But just because, you know, I, so I, what I hear is people that specialize in paid, they say, well, if I can get half my traffic from organic, then my effective CPAs or CACs fall in half, yeah. which, which isn't true because the thing that allows you to do paid is the fact that it worked organically. If you have customers that love you, that's the sign that you can now go into paid. You don't use paid as a way to try to figure out the business model. <laughs> the business model has to exist first. I see a lot of folks that do less than seven figures in e -com, and they think that they're going to use paid as a way to figure out their strategy. No, no, no. Once the strategy is working, then you use paid on top of that because then you know it's going to scale up into the limit of what the market size is mm. or what your LTV is or your acceptable you know, CAC versus LTV ratios are. Yeah, I put my hand up and just flat out say that that was me. I used ads to work out my business model and Facebook decided, I think it might have been 2018, end of 2018, decided, look, Jared, we're just going to shut down your account and you're never going to be able to use Facebook again. <laughs> and I uh, had to re-change re my whole business model uh, yeah. to suit the organic route. Still can't yeah. use, I st still can't use ads uh, on Facebook. Uh, can in many other places but why not youtube why not snapchat well, exactly. and tiktok why not which is what know? we which is why, why would you be dependent upon one thing it's like having only one supplier yeah you know one manufacturer it's just too risky yeah i definitely definitely learned the hard way so tell me about the uh dollar a day strategy i want to i want to 
I want people listening to know what the dollar a day strategy is because you've helped a lot of brand, not just not just influencers, but brands build from the dollar a day strategy. So what is it? How does it look? How does it work? We spent a billion dollars using this dollar a day strategy across every single channel and almost every kind of business. And we did it for Rosetta Stone, for Nike, for Starbucks, for Ashley Furniture, all kinds of companies and even small companies, you know, little real estate companies, restaurants. And the key is this, it's very simple. The dollar day strategy is putting out lots of pieces of content and testing for a dollar a day. So for a week, which is spending $7 per piece of content. So we did the Golden State Warriors, which is a basketball team for five and a half years. Mm. And we would have a grid of all these different videos and offers. Some would be Steph Curry making this amazing shot. One would be a, hey, a new jersey that we have or buy tickets to this game. Or we have all these different ads, for example. And if I gave you, if I said, Jared, here's a grid of 100 different ads, you would not be able to pick out the winner. And if it, you gave it to me, like, hey, Dennis, what do you think of all these ones? Which ones do you think is the best one? I'm like, ah, I think this one, right? Yeah. And you and I would be completely wrong because mm. the data will tell us what the winner is. So dollar a day is just a testing strategy. And other people say, well, why only a dollar a day? My, I, you know, I spend $100,000 a month. Well, good for you. It allows you to run more experiments because when you find a winner, then you can put $100, $1,000. We've had some campaigns we've spent a million dollars a day. Like Rosetta Stone, the language company. We were spending over a million dollars a day on Facebook and on Google. So you can imagine Facebook and Google flew in to see us instead of us flying to see them. And they brought food, <laughs> hockey tickets, like everything that we wanted. Sheryl Sandberg talked about, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg talked about the, the, us as a case study, the largest ever user of Facebook offers, all kinds of great stuff. Mm. But yeah. it was using the dollar a day methodology. Even in horrible, boring industries like Infusionsoft, which is now called Keep, which is marketing automation. It's like HubSpot or ActiveCampaign. And they made 100 different, you don't have to make 100. But in this case, with uh, Natalie Ferreira, who ran digital marketing, we made 100 different videos. I contributed a few videos about, hey, here's what you need to know about marketing automation. Put in your email address and they'll give you 10 more tips or whatever, right? And then Natalie would make ones. And then the, the CEO, Clayton Mask, was eating fried chicken. And then he was, you know, because as a hook to get your attention, he's answering questions while he's eating fried chicken, you know, just like the hot sauce ones. And we had 100 of these different videos. And no one would have guessed which one the winner would have been. He couldn't, Clayton Mask, the founder, couldn't guess. I couldn't guess. Natalie couldn't guess. The other folks in digital marketing couldn't guess. But the winner, we put, I forgot how much we put, but in total, we put $1.3 million. Into the winning, into the winner. Into two or three of those ones that were winners mm. out of the 100 initial. <clears throat> so we spent $700. You, you know, like in sports, they have these playoff brackets where, Initially, there's like 64 teams, and then, you know, there's 16 and four, and eventually there's like one at the top yeah. of the bracket, yeah. right? That's what we're doing with dollar a day. We're letting all the ads compete, and we're letting the system determine what the best one is. Mm. Now, the cool thing about dollar a day, because people say, oh, but you don't have statistical significance, and, you know, you should be optimizing the CPA, and like, yeah, we're optimized. Ultimately, we're optimizing the conversion, but if you're running ads in a social format, especially Facebook or TikTok or whatnot, you could have an amazing offer and whatever, but if people don't stay with you the first two seconds, if they scroll past you, it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of the video. So dollar a day, the first part is just determining how many through plays you get, how many people get past the first two or three seconds, and then it's a matter of can we convert them, can we convince them. But you can save the majority of your testing budget. You don't have to waste your budget optimizing for the full conversion if you know that 80, 90% of people are going to skip past your video in the first two seconds, it doesn't matter what happens after the two seconds, they've already left you. So we're using dollar a day as this initial filter. And then of those ones that remain, then we optimize for conversions and the ones that convert, then we'll put $1,000 a day, $10,000 a gate against it. Because pe people will say, well, a dollar a day strategy doesn't work for our business because we spend $100,000 a month. Great. It'll work even better for you because you can test more. Yeah, you're putting most of your work into the testing phase. And I think most people forget. Yeah. Well, most people that start out that don't know much about digital 
marketing. They're like, I'm gonna, I want to spend, you know, maybe a thousand dollars a month. What, you know, two thousand, three thousand, up to five thousand dollars a month. What sh- sort of results should I? Expect? And they put it on one ad. Yeah, and it's and then it's they say like, it didn't work. Yeah, yeah. You tried one ad. Oh, Facebook ads didn't work. I tried it. <laughs> yes. Show me your testing. Mm-hmm. Show me your goals, content, and targeting. Show me that you have an existing creative that already works, and you're trying to make something better than that because you're already taking the seed of why it's already working about why people already love you if it's a new product then people don't know about you or your product or whatever you have to solve the strategy issue first to understand what exact problem you're solving in the market then you can make videos around different angles around that but at least you're starting with the winner dollar a day is assuming you're starting with a business strategy and you're starting with the winner where where you have happy customers that use your product yeah, and you've got you can use social proof in those ad video ads and whatnot, right? Yeah, yeah. And the ones with celebrities don't convert as well because people assume it's we've tested this with a list celebrities. People say, well, that's my buddy Josh Snow. He paid Floyd Mayweather, who's a boxer, a lot of money, mm. and then he paid other people that are not even well known. And those other people that are not even celebrities, they're not even influencers, converted even better because people assume that the a list celebrity is being paid to say that which they were. (laughs) They were, but you figure fame is better and the big influence who has 14 million followers and all that. No, people want something that looks real. Yeah. And even like handy cam videos of, you know, uh, not just the Ty Lopez in my Not even handy cam, but just selfie walk and talk videos outperform the professional. And you can tell when it's an ad. Yeah. It's landscape. It's a clear, the, the lighting's too good. Obviously it's a model. The way they're saying it doesn't seem very natural. You just It just screams ad, I don't trust this. Yeah. And then there's a call to action with the big button. It's heavily edited, so you can tell some video editor had to go. Lots, some of the best converting ads we've ever had had no editing on them at all. Mm. And you could tell it was an amateur person who didn't even speak very well, but they seemed authentic. It seemed like it was someone you could trust. Mm. And that's why people buy is trust, right? I love going to companies where they have a professional videographer who's done cinematography, movies, this kind of thing. And they'll spend, the the brand will spend $50,000 on this professional thing, red cameras and all of this stuff, right? The full deal. And then I walk in with an iPhone and I record a few different videos from a few different angles with real customers, showing them actually using the product. I film it vertically. I do have good sound, but I hide the microphone. And I run different combinations, 10, 20 combinations. This other company makes their one masterpiece. Who do you think is going to win, Jared? Me with my, I'm not a professional videographer. I'm, an, I'm a search engine engineer. <laughs> I didn't speak English until I was six. I'm a math guy. Who's going to win? The math guy with 10 or 14 different attempts or the professional videographer who has just one attempt? Who's going to win? Well, it's, it comes down to you being real with the customers and just having a chat, yeah. right? Having a bit of a yeah. yarn and just... How, how could you not win when it's like, hey, I'm not trying to like mm-hmm. make this yeah. too polished? We did this with Ashley Furniture, which is the world's largest furniture manufacturer, largest furniture retailer. They're bigger than Ikea and whatnot. And they were running ads that were made by a professional agency. I won't name them, but you could tell they were TV ads, okay? And we had just, these were not professional actors. I, I just had these store managers in different, in different stores get videos from the different salespeople and the delivery people as they're carrying the sofa up the stairs, like all these different sorts of scenarios. And we tested it for a dollar a day. And we had a 22 ROAS. We spent a dollar and we drove $22 of provable sales in the POS that we matched back via offline conversions, right? Not leads, not store visits, sales in the POS mapped back to the name and phone number, right? Mm. And it was using all this amateur video. And this is when I knew it worked, Jared. This is what happened. It was a mistake, but we had ones in Alabama, and people in Alabama talk with a strong accent. Alabama football this is a go around on Sunday. We watch football on TV. And those were working well in Alabama. But one of our people goofed up and accidentally ran those in Seattle mm-hmm. and in Amherst, New Hampshire, and in Cleveland, Ohio, and other places where they don't talk like that. And I thought, oh, they're going to fire us because we totally goofed this up because it's supposed to be in the South, right? And it converted just as well. And then we realized, you know what? 
I used to think like if you live in Miami where there's a beach and it's sunny and all this, like you can't run that in Dallas where it's a different area. Like all these different areas are also geographically different, but they're actually not as different as you think they are because people buy from other people. And if you're going to buy furniture or a pillow or a table or a painting or whatnot, you're going to buy from other people that you resonate with. And because Facebook and Twitter and YouTube targets by people who you know, like you watch a YouTube video, you see other videos that are like that. It will naturally show that video to other people that identify with those people. And that, that's why TikTok has taken off so much. Mm. You're counting on the system to find the other people that will resonate with that black girl, with frizzy hair or whatever. They, they will find those kinds. And in every city, in every scenario, there is, there's different proportions of people in different niches, but you'll always find every kind of niche in every city. So you don't have to demographic target. It works amazing. So franchises, we've done a ton of this with franchises. It works well. We can reuse the creative nationwide. And we discovered this with Ashley Furniture. And there's a whole case study that Facebook put out there. I think Google put out a case study as well on what we did that shows that this testing strategy works. Wow. That's... Plus nationally, you get to go across, you get way more data you get to statistical significance a lot faster, right? Instead of just testing in one market, if something works and you test nationwide, nobody can beat you, right? Right. Because you just have way more data. Yeah. The person and the business with the most amount of data makes the smartest decisions. Um, if they use the data properly, yeah. yeah. If they use <laughs> And they build their custom audiences if properly, tool, if they have they tag managers the set yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. Tell, Just because uh, someone spends more money doesn't mean that they're smarter. No, correct. And they could be spending that amount of money in the wrong direction if they didn't analyze the data correctly, which is why it's yeah. helpful to have somebody who knows how to uh, understand what, what's working and what isn't working based on the nuances with the, with the different ad sets. Yeah. I want to talk about mentorship and mindset. First and foremost, yeah. mentorship. How big has mentorship been? Like what sort of a role has mentorship played out for you uh, in, in you becoming more successful at what you're doing now. Have you worked with many mentors? Do you advocate mentors? Tell me about like what your connection is with mentors. Everything <laughs> in my life came because of a mentor. Mm. Every failure that I've ever had was because of me. I first got my start in business because one guy who happened to be the CEO of American Airlines believed in me. And had he not opened that door... Who knows where I would have been? You know, maybe I'd be a, at the convenience store. I don't know. I maybe would have done something with my life. You know, mm. been a real estate agent. Who knows? But every door that's been open for me has been because of a mentor. I consider having a mentor like cheating. It's just so good. And a lot of us are super smart, and we believe like the entrepreneur works really hard all by themselves, and they figure it out. And every successful business person I know has a mentor and multiple mentors, mentors in different areas. And the best way to find a mentor, because anyone's going to want to give you advice, whether they're qualified or not, is you find someone who's done the thing that you want to do. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to grow an agency to several thousand people. And I knew how to grow it to a, a few dozen people, you know, 50 people, 100 people. But there's a difference when you want to go to 2,000 people. So, of course, other people who are business people wanted to give me advice. My mom wanted to give me advice, but she's never grown an agency to 2,000 people. So I talked to Dwayne Nesmith. Dwayne Nesmith is the founder of Scient Viant and grew an agency to thousands of people. And I said, Dwayne, give me advice. Look at my situation. Just go ahead and don't be afraid of being like rude. Just go ahead and tell me, what do I need to know, right? Look at my situation. Look at how I'm organizing. Look at what we pay. Look at our operations. Look at how much we charge. Look at everything. And he said, yep, Dennis, according, you know, what I can see here is you need to do this, this, and this. And I've kept in touch with Dwayne for the last 20 years. Mm. And now his son might come work for us, which I think is really cool. Maybe it's like a way of paying it back where like he's helped me and now I kind of like, I'm going to help his son out. Yeah. But yeah. mentorship is everything if you have a clear goal of what you want to achieve. So then you can find someone who's achieved that very goal. If you don't have that goal already set, how do you figure out who the mentor is? It should, the mentor should only be someone who's achieved the goal, the thing that you want to achieve. If you just want to make money or whatever, then anybody can be a mentor. Figure out exactly that thing and find other people who have done that. Those people will probably – this is going to piss off a lot of coaches. Those people who will be mentors for you will probably not charge you. There's a lot of people that will charge you a lot of money. 
to give you coaching or advice in your online business. And there's nothing wrong with buying coaching. But if you want a mentor, I believe a mentor can't charge you. And the mentor also has to achieve the thing. They can give you great advice, but all, the only legitimate mentors, and I'm gonna, I get a lot of hate when I say this, <laughs> but I still stand behind it. I only accept advice from a mentor. They're only credible in my mind if they have achieved the thing that I want to do. They have personally achieved it multiple times. I need to see that's the case. I don't care how many books they've read. I don't care what certification they have. I don't care how confident they think they are. It's like an obese weight loss coach. You might know what to do, but you're not practicing it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So with that, with that one rule, like who's credible? That knocks out 99% of the people like your mom that want to give you, they love you to death, but they are not credible in providing advice. Yeah, well, they haven't walked that journey and been successful in that avenue multiple times. And the question that's on a lot of people's lips now that you've mentioned, don't pay for mentors. And a lot of people, I'm a coach. I'm not, I'm not offended at all. Um, I'm still going to charge for my help. Uh, but I would love to hear, hear you explain how do you get mentors for free? Well, you not figure you out a way to get them. It's, it's actually free, really, it's really you know, easy like, to get mentors. Yeah. It, it, as long as you don't make these common mistakes. So I get hit up because I've had, I've been lucky to have some successes and I get hit up all the time by people who want mentorship and they say mentorship because they really just want free coaching. Mm. Coaching and mentorship are not the same thing. The way you approach a potential mentor is you have to know about them. You have to know what they care about. You can't just say, Hey, can I just get with you on the phone every hour and just ask you all kinds of questions that, you know, every, every week, I just want to ask you questions. No, that's coaching. Mm. Um, with a mentor, you believe in what they're doing. You've already put in the effort before you ever reach out to read the books that they've written, to see what they're up to, to like really care about what's going on in their life. And when you become kind of like a disciple in a way, then mentors will, they, they love I don't care how important they are, unless they're like Richard Branson or Elon Musk. But outside of that, the people I know, some of these people are super successful, are happy to mentor because they see other people that are up and coming. So today I was at the house of Andrew Cartwright, and this guy has done hundreds of millions of dollars, provably, 32 businesses, all this. And he had a 22-year-old who he's mentoring. And I, I told this guy, Will, I, I said, Will, what an incredible opportunity you have to learn from a business legend and be able to hang out and help them do video and edit stuff and, you know, go through all these proposals where all these people are trying to hit them up to be a spokesperson mm -hmm. for their thing. What an incredible opportunity. And that's great for the figurehead because you get someone who's an apprentice who's going to stay with you and learn the ropes and maybe eventually become like a business owner that, you know, you fund their business or whatever it is. And that the apprentice gets a lot of opportunity, but it's not the same thing as a business owner that just wants to get free coaching. That's what most people get wrong. They're, oh, I can get Dennis as a mentor. Great. Why would I join any of his coaching programs when I can just get free mentorship? Yeah. That's, they're not the same thing. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot where the person that wants a mentor is going to be prepared to do whatever that, whatever is needed for their mentor yeah. and make their life better basically. And is playing, I guess the difference is short-term game versus long-term game. Somebody yeah. that wants coaching is like, I just want this for the short term. <coughs> right. Somebody wants a mentor is like, hey, I'll, I'll work with you for decades yeah. and I know that I'll get something, I'll, I'll get the education. Like, I don't even need finances yeah. right now. I'll get the education. It doesn't have, it's not about decades, yeah. but it's, it's some kind of like, if you, if you look at the guilds in Europe, you know, you wanted to become a blacksmith or whatever, then you worked as an apprentice for six or seven years. You didn't go to college necessarily, mm. but you worked mm. enough you know, to the point where you could run that business. And that business owner would be, they'd want, it made economic sense to invest in these younger folks mm. because these could be people that work in your business, that run your business, because, you know, you're going to retire at some point and it makes sense, right? You look at the, the Jiro Dreams of Sushi, right? That yeah. Netflix documentary. Yep. And the son, you know, who's, all it becomes 50 because Jiro's like 80 or something like that mm -hmm. is, is in line to be able to take over the franchise or start other businesses. It works for everybody, but the, with mentorship, it has to work for both sides. Yeah. And, and be fulfilling for both sides. So yeah. you've, like you said, you've worked with so many people successful that are quite successful billionaires, if you will, what do you see that 
these this caliber of people have in common with each other the most the most sort of like and it might be two or three things and it may just be one yeah. standout thing but what yeah. what is it that you see there's two things about billionaires and i'm qualified to talk about this because i've met enough of them i've been very fortunate mm. one is that they're really nice people now people who are rich you could draw the line at you know Money rich or million dollars. money rich or like money rich or like whatever, yeah. like materially successful. Okay. Yeah. Good. good they, they're still climbing the ladder. They still, they're still hungry, but people who have made it to the billionaire level, they are just the coolest people to hang out with. Not because they're rich or have, you know, jets and boats and all that. <laughs> I love flying on these. Like when, when I get invited to go on the jets and boats, I always say yes. So I guess I'm, a human, you know, but that's, that's not why I go. It's because they have this abundance mindset. Mm. So when I was with Naveen Jain, who's a billionaire, it was kind of neat hanging out with him. He and I are having dinner and other people are coming up. These rude people interrupting us while he and I are having dinner, mm. right? And they're asking questions like, hey, uh, one quick, you know, hey, I got a business pitch. I'd love to tell you about this idea. You know, maybe you can invest. And like, I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding. Wow. But he would be polite and say, well, Dennis and I are having dinner. But let me tell you one thing. If you want to be a billionaire, create $100 billion of value. Solve a $100 billion problem. If you want to be a millionaire, solve a $100 million problem. Mm. Right? If you want to be an employee, solve a $100,000 problem. And I've just been very lucky. I'm not special or anything like that. I just happen to be around these people at the right time. Like I, was, I would have dinner all the time with the richest man in the world under 40, who was David Philo before Mark Zuckerberg. And he was at Yahoo. And I just happened to, it's not because I'm special. I just happened to be there in the early days when the thing kind of got going. And David Philo was just the most down to earth kind of dude. He drove this beat up piece of crap BMW. It was like gray rusted Bondo. He had old shoes. He had t-shirts with holes in them. He did not look like a billionaire, mm. but he was, and he was just totally cool. And he would wait in line like everyone else. It was just cool hanging out with him. So the, the abundance mindset was something you don't see from everyone else. It, you, like, it's only, only like people who have, who have made it that don't feel like they have to prove anything to you. You don't see them driving Lamborghinis or like they, they just they drive Toyota Priuses and they wear cheap watches. Hey, I'll give you another example. And I'm trying to name drop, but I'm just giving you examples because I believe that the only people who can give credible advice are those who have actually done the thing. So I'm with Bill Harnish, who's the guy who funded Costco and Best Buy. He invested to, to you know, put the money behind these two. You've heard of these companies. And we're in, I think we're in Park City. And we're on our way to one of the ski resorts that he owns. And we stop at Costco. And he, he buys the gigantic six-pack of blueberry muffins, which is like one of the best things to get at Costco. <laughs> and we're walking back through the parking lot with some of the stuff that we're going to put in the ski resort for the few days we're going to be skiing. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye, I said, no, there's, there's a Nike outlet store. I went and I thought, I just blurted out. I wasn't thinking. I said, wow, man, I want to get a new pair of running shoes. He's like, oh, Dennis, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead? And, and like, are you sure? Like, yeah, yeah. I got to, you know, make a couple phone calls. So I made a billionaire wait in the car for 40 minutes so I could save $10, $15 hmm. at an outlet store on a pair of Nikes. Oh, uh, yeah. What do you think that guy's time was worth for another 40 minutes Hurt. while I made him wait? Yeah. In the car. Yeah. Right. Super, but super nice. Right? I never thought about that. I don't think he thought about it. I don't think he was like, dang it. That Dennis guy is just wasting my time making <laughs> me wait in the car. I'm a billionaire. You know, I make more money than most people just when I brush my teeth than they do in the whole year. Like he doesn't, like, there's none of that. Yeah. They're just so cool to hang out with. And so because of that, they're willing to give advice. They're willing to mentor. I'm not saying seek only billionaires for mentorship, but People who have been successful, and I don't mean financially successful, people who are successful in something feel kind of this need to like pay it forward mm. and give back. Mm. And that's, that's kind of the sign of when someone can be a good mentor because they're in that stage in their career where there's more behind them than ahead of them, which is kind of sad in a way. But it, in some ways, they adopt you as like a surrogate child, which is really cool. Mm. Yeah, I guess once, I don't know what it's like, you know, but I, I could see from their point of view with the having more behind you than ahead of you, knowing that you've done some, made some really impactful things in the world, yeah. you would be crazy 
and if you wanted to continue to make an impact, you would it'd be hard for you to not want to share that and give your yeah. your wisdom and your knowledge to somebody that can carry a legacy, even even if it's not their own legacy, but build yes. out their build out another avenue of um, impact in the world. Yeah. You know, Jack Ma, yeah. who's the founder of Alibaba, yeah. a billionaire now. And I remember in the early days, he came to Yahoo. This was 25 years ago before he was a big deal. Mm. And this guy was this skinny, wiry, high energy man who said the way he made money, like he would just answer all kinds of questions we'd ask him about, like pop ups and email and all these crazy kinds of things. <laughs> and then he said recently, he said there's three stages in life. So the first decade in life, you're a worker and you want to, you know, start a career and gain the skills and move up the ladder and make more money, work really, really hard, right? The second decade of your life, you're more like a manager and you're managing a business. You've got people that you work for, you're hiring and firing, you're buying and selling. But then you enter the third decade of your career. And that's when you're a mentor. That's when you're giving back. Mm. That's when you're helping others, right? And he said this, I think, when he was officially a billionaire. And people said, oh, you're amazing. You're a billionaire. Because, you know, once you become a billionaire, I don't know. I'm not a billionaire. But I've been around enough other people who have. And they've told me, you know, what the deal is. But these people, they undergo this transformation where they, instead of, like, celebrating and, you know, Scrooge McDuck with all the money, you know, <laughs> like – throwing the money in the air, diving into the swimming pool full of money. Like <laughs> instead of those cartoonish things, yeah. you, you, like you've seen those cartoons. But instead of that, you see them more reflective, more like thinking about how do I make the best use of the rest of my time on this planet? Mm. Maybe the best example is if you see Ray Dalio, mm. one of the most successful men on the planet. He's written two amazing books. Right. Principles, which is how to think objectively and make decisions, and another one about the big long cycle, what's going to happen with the rest of the world and U.S. and China and this mm -hmm. kind of thing. And when you see him do this, he is just giving. So it's like sitting down with Ray Dalio, and he's just sharing so much and knowledge. And he's on so many story. podcasts regularly as well. Yeah, like just and he he out. talks about what it's like being in the face, and he's not cocky or boasting or anything like that. But you, you, you hear his methodology and how he's thinking about giving back. And that people who think that way are the kind of people you want as a mentor. Yeah. Yeah, wow. This has been such a great conversation. Uh, I know that we're on the hour here, but I just want to say thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to link to the definitive guide to TikTok ads, your book. Thank you. Uh, I'm also going to link to Bizmetrics and your own domain dennisu.com is there anywhere else we can send people to check out more of your stuff and, and what you got guys are doing with your agency and stuff follow me on linkedin yeah follow me on facebook follow me on any channel that you like and i have content on all of those i understand like some people they prefer to watch youtube videos and you'll see all our stuff on dollar a day and a hubspot's channel infusionsoft my own some people like to read articles like however you like to read however you like to learn use that mode, right? And I believe anyone who's an educator respects the fact that people learn in different ways and you just put your stuff out there across all the channels and just, you know, engage with me on Twitter, whatever your favorite place is, let's engage. Yeah, awesome. Guys, there'll be links in the show notes. Uh, check out Dennis Hugh and Dennis, thanks so much for listening. Everybody that is listening, please, please, please. I never, I never really ask for people to subscribe. So I'm not going to even ask for people to subscribe to this, but what I want people to do that are listening, that got value from this is just share it with somebody because it's going to be helpful. Yeah. Selfishly for Jared and Dennis, but the things that we mentioned here around mindset and how billionaires operate are just great life lessons. And I think it's going to be valuable for you to share this with your friends that are business owners and thinking about getting mentors. The best way to learn something, to lock it, to kick it from short term into long term memory is to share something, yeah. to put it into practice. And when you share it, it causes you to like regroove those brain thoughts to, to test your comprehension. Like you might think you understand something, but until you have to explain it to someone else, you don't really know whether you know that mm, or not. Mm. So it's actually really good for you to be able to share it. And so when I've learned something from somebody, I literally pull out my phone and I have them, hey, let, let me just make sure I understood you correctly, Jared. What I hear you saying is this, and then they can correct me. And it's an opportunity for me to practice my listening skills. So I think this is a great way 
just the discipline. Mm. Otherwise, you're just like watching TV and it's just entertainment. But if you're doing this to improve yourself, you have to actively be paying attention and sharing it and then reflecting that against other people who can then tell you what your blind spots are. Spot on. People will hold you accountable to you knowing what you're sharing. And that's yeah. really good. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dennis. Really Thank appreciate you, your time. Hey YouTube watcher, if you thought that video was good, you should check out this video here on the two best types of websites beginners should buy. Or check out my playlist on how I made my first 100K from buying websites and how to do due diligence. Check it out, it's an awesome playlist, you'll enjoy it.